morning. This is Pastor David Packer from International Baptist Church in Stuttgart, Germany. You can see behind me the seats are empty. Of course, this is a Saturday while I'm recording this. But tomorrow we are going to have some people join us. We're able to meet uh, in a controlled situation. And many will also be joining us by a Zoom meeting. And this video is prepared for those that have enjoyed the videos. And you can uh, listen to this in your living room. And uh, either way, I pray that God would use this message to bless your life. Um, what we're looking at today is how to endure trouble. For the last several months, we've been going through the book of Acts, and we've learned a lot in our journey over the last several months. We've learned the history of the church. We've traced the beginnings of the church, the persecution of the church. Uh, we've seen the expansion of the church. Uh, we've seen these key moments when the gospel was, was uh, brought to the Jewish nation in Jerusalem, and then to the Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles. Uh, we've met some key individuals. We've learned more about Peter than they would have otherwise. Also, uh, Saul, the, Saul the Pharisee who became Paul the Apostle, and many others as well. Uh, we have learned a lot about the methods of the apostles to expand the church. But today we're taking a deeper look at a certain theme in the Bible, and that is the theme of suffering or the same theme of, of problems or afflictions or difficulty or even persecution. And how can a Christian endure these things? Well, our text is the 14th chapter of Acts, and this is one of the deeper truths of Acts. Uh, it describes a reality to the Christian life, that is the, the reality of hardship and suffering. And uh, it comes, our text comes at the end of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. Uh, they are in the city of Derby, and that's as far as they go. Then they turn back around and they visit the cities they had been to before to start churches, to visit the disciples, the followers of Christ they had made in those cities. Here's what we read. This is Acts 14, verse 21 through 23. They, Paul and Barnabas, preached the good news in that city, Derby, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must... We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committing them, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Now, it's interesting that they said we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Suffering and hardship is a consistent theme in the New Testament. Uh, we see, for example, John the Apostle writing from the Isle of Patmos in Revelation. In the first chapter, verse 9, he says this, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. If sufferings are entrusted to us, so is the strength of God entrusted to us to face them. But we see the same thing in Peter's writings and in Paul's writings and and throughout the New Testament, suffering is a reality of a Christ follower. Jesus said that uh, no servant is above his master. If I, your Lord and your master, uh, experience rejection, if I suffered, uh, you also as my followers will suffer. So we should expect it. Now, in the history of the church, there have been different ways people have understood suffering. And some have even invited it and even embraced it as a spiritual discipline. Now, there's some suffering that is not necessary. Some people believe that uh, in order to be an evangelist, you have to be rude to people and insult them. Of course, if you're rude, people will not act kindly towards you and they'll reject you. But that's nonsense. There's nothing that says a, an evangelist must be rude. Evangelists should be gracious and, and, uh, and loving and kind. Uh, but also, we see some people throughout the history of the church have embraced uh, a discipline of suffering or of, of self-subjection and, and even a morbid type of devotional life where they punish themselves thinking that this will bring them closer to Christ, either physical punishment or emotional and spiritual punishment or some type of devotional concentration uh, that it just focuses on negative and painful and hurtful things. 
Now, it is true the Bible says that we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin, uh, that we are crucified with Christ. But we're not dead just to be dead. We're dead in order to live. We're dead in order to be raised with Christ and enjoy the new life. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20 said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. He didn't say I am crucified with Christ and end it there. Uh, but he is getting himself uh, out of the way so that God may fill him with his presence and with his love. Now, there's been another extreme reaction to this in the other direction. That is the health and wealth theology uh, that says that there's a Christian should not suffer at all. A Christian should be healthy and wealthy and successful in every uh, worldly estimation. And now, uh, lately, the church has rejected that as a whole and understood that's a false teaching. Uh, but it is true uh, that if God fills you with His Spirit, uh, if He who made you fills you with His Spirit, everything about you will work better uh, than it would without God. That's just common sense, or, or maybe we say sanctified common sense. So if, if God fills you with His Spirit, He will teach you discipline and every skill you need for success in this world. Uh, but for a Christian, our goal uh, should never be worldly success or even our physical health. Our goal is much greater than that. That is to honor God with our hearts and our lives, holiness, righteousness, uh, in tune with God, following Him, being filled with His Spirit, living for His glory, and putting our lives in His hands no matter what. Uh, that is the goal for a Christian, to honor Him, to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Uh, but the Bible does speak about suffering in many different places. Now, in this passage, uh, where we read these words, uh, we must go through many hardships to enter uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, it's very interesting the way it says that, and we may misunderstand that. Uh, in fact, it, it uses this little Greek word, deo, is the way that word sounds, uh, but the way it's used, especially with the accusative voice, it has a certain context to it. Now, this, these words, by the way, are similar to what uh, the, uh, the Lord said to Ananias. Remember the story of, of uh, Paul's conversion? Ananias was a believer in Damascus where Paul was going. And, and uh, God called to Ananias in a vision and said to him to go to Paul. He had become a believer. He said, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings, before the people of Israel. And then he says this, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Again, that word must is deo in the original language. Now, deo is an interesting word, and when it's used with the accusative, it means something other than we may think. For he's not saying, for example, that we must suffer these things in order to enter the kingdom. That is, that our sufferings earn our salvation. He's not saying that. And he's not really even saying that our, our, we must enter the kingdom of God and as a part of our journey, sufferings are part of it. He's not really even saying that. R rather, this word carries a certain meaning and it describes it uh, in what it's describing it, it, there, that it is a necessity lying in the nature of the situation or the nature of the case. Uh, and it, that little word means that suffering and following Christ are inseparable realities, that the nature of following Christ will bring suffering. It's unavoidable. Now, for another example, in John 3.30, that word is used for another situation. It's when uh, John the Baptist speaks of the Christ, and he says, He must increase, and I must decrease. Again, that word, deo, or translated must. And he's describing the reality of the Christ coming into the world, and that Paul, excuse me, John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Messiah. And he's saying that the situation as it is, it's, it's no question but that this must be the case, uh, that the Christ coming into the world means the Christ's ascendancy and his increasing. And, and John, as the, as the forerunner, he must decrease, must become less. So it's something similar to what we say in, in English, if someone were to say, of course, we can say this in many other languages as well, or something like it. We could say, you know, you must get your hands dirty to do gardening. 
Now, when we say that, we do not mean uh, that it's a moral obligation to get yourself dirty as you do gardening. What we mean is the two are inseparable. To do gardening means you're going to get dirty. So the same way it means to be a Christ follower brings us into suffering, brings us into difficulty. Why should that be the case? Well, we have three enemies. We have the world, the world system that's a fallen world system. We have the flesh within us, that is the old sinful nature that we each carry. At salvation, we receive a new nature, but we have the old nature still in us until we go to be with God. And then the third is the devil, the world, the flesh within us, our sinful nature, and the devil. The devil is a very powerful spiritual enemy, in, entity, a very powerful spiritual being created by God, but he has created to be a lovely, beautiful angel, but rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven. And now uh, he leads a worldwide uh, evil empire uh, to oppose the work of God. And God limits him because he is not equal to God in strength. God limits him in the right time. God will destroy him and his, and his angels. But the devil is a reality. Satan and the deceiver, whatever, how you want to understand him, he is also a reality. And all three of these realities, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, bring suffering into our life. Now, this morning we're going to look at these three things that Paul and Barnabas said they were going to do uh, to the church. And uh, we see in this passage, again in Acts 14, when they go back to the disciples, uh, they say, Two things they will do, and a third thing uh, they did do. Uh, then it said they, coming, they went back, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And the final thing is they committed them to the Lord through prayer and fasting. And these three things, uh, to teach the truth and to encourage one another and to pray, those three things are how we get through difficulty, how God strengthens us in the midst of difficulty. Now, by the way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a great quote about this whole issue of suffering. Bonhoeffer, in his, in his writing in English, it's called the, uh, the Cost of Discipleship. But in German, it's simply the, the name of it is Discipleship itself, or Nachfolge. Uh, and here's what he says, the English translation. Suffering, then, is the badge of true discipleship. The disciple is not above his master. Following Christ means Passio passive, that is passive suffering. Suffering because we have to suffer. Suffering because it's the nature of the case. So, we're going to look at these three things. First of all, we see they strengthen the disciples. They strengthen the disciples when they came back through. Now, when Paul uses that word strengthening, it means they strengthen them through teaching them the Word of God, teaching them the gospel. That's how we are strong in the Lord, by hearing the teaching of God's Word, and by not just hearing it, not just being in the same room, but paying attention, listening to it, and applying it to our life. The truth of Christ's victory, the truth of the end times, the truth that God shall win and overpower all of His enemies, uh, those truths, the truth of our forgiveness in Christ and our redemption in Christ, those truths are to be uh, in our hearts and to ground us in the faith, in the Christian faith. Now, the world has many lies. It, it has deception right and left. One person says this, another person says that, and deceptions are endless. They're everywhere and they go on all the time. The world is a very confusing place, even a chaotic place in terms of ideas. And the Christian in this world needs to be grounded in the truth of God. In Romans 15, 4, here's what the Apostle Paul said. So that through the endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Uh, through the endurance and the encouragement of Scriptures, uh, we are grounded to face trouble and we can have hope even in the midst of difficult situations. Uh, to the Christians at Colossae and Colossians chapter 1, 23, he's speaking to them about the priorities they should accept. And he says this, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. And that means that we are to grasp the truth, understand the truth, and hold on to it. 
When trouble comes upon a Christian, when difficulty, persecution, rejection, whatever it is, whenever trouble comes upon a Christian, we should be aware that we are facing a fallen world. We are followers of Christ in a world that had him crucified. Uh, and the world is not a friendly place to anyone, let alone a Christian. And this is what, what Paul came to do. This is why he came. This is why God sent him. Uh, to into the world to teach and to teach the truth. And this is why we read what the Holy Spirit inspired him and others in the Bible to write because it builds us up. In Colossians 1, 24 through 25, he wrote these words, the very next section of, of Scripture, what we read before. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now he spoke about uh, the, uh, the, the what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. He doesn't mean that there's anything lacking in Christ's suffering for our sin. When Christ died on the cross, he cried from the cross, it is finished, meaning he paid the price in full. And all of the sins of the whole world who will turn and put their faith and trust in Christ, they are paid for by the cross of Christ. So we don't help Christ earn our salvation by our own suffering. What is he speaking about? What he's speaking about the fact that Christ did not go to the believers in, or to the lost people in Colossae and preach. Paul went in his stead. And in that sense, Paul was suffering in for the name of Christ, or he was filling up what was lacking because Christ couldn't go to Colossae. And all of us do that. When we serve Christ, when we teach the truth, we are, and we're facing rejection by the world, uh, we are filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the world. We are there in his stead, sent by him, empowered by him, teaching his truth. That is what we do. And it strengthens believers. It strengthens believers makes them strong, enables them to face rejection and difficulty. Now, the world itself is a fallen system. In 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, it says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Well, see, the world is all around us. Its values are everywhere. Uh, we hear the world, we, we see the world. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we run into the world. Uh, when we listen to a song on the radio, we will pick up on worldly values. When we engage a, a friend or a neighbor in a conversation, the world can seep into that conversation. And even, even when we're ministering in the church, we find the world is in the church. We bring it in by our own sinful nature. And the confusion of the world and the deception of the world is everywhere. The world chases after its lust, lust of the flesh, lust to, to feel something, lust of the eyes, lust to have something we can see, uh, and the pride of life, thinking we're better than other people. All this is in the world, and all of this is passing away. And we need to be, uh, be aware of the evil in the world, of the values, the fallen values of the world, and make sure our hearts are committed to Christ, confessing our sins, turning to Him constantly, and letting him cleanse us. This is a Christian's great need. We can expect the world to reject us, not to be, un, not to be uh, sympathetic to our cause, even understand why we do what we do. But God will give us the grace, and that's why we need to be grounded in him. God will give us the grace uh, to endure. When I was a child uh, in, my, uh, in my home, we went to church regularly, and my mother and father, they'd make sure that we got baths on Saturday night, me and my brothers. Uh, Saturday night, that was the cleanest we were all week. Uh, and we go to bed, uh, new sheets, clean bodies. <laughs> um, and the next morning, uh, when we got up for breakfast, Sunday breakfast in our house, we were usually a little special. We had something we didn't have 
uh, every breakfast. That is something like cinnamon rolls or something. And as a child, I always looked forward to Sunday breakfast. And I can remember jumping out of bed, smelling something delicious coming from the kitchen, running into the kitchen, ready to eat, and my mother saying, go wash your hands. I say, wait a minute, Mom, I just took a bath last night. That was the cleanest I'd been all week. Why do I need to wash my hands? She said, you, you got dirty overnight. Your hands got dirty overnight. Um, and that's the way it is in the world. Uh, we just walk down the street. Uh, we just listen to a television show or a newscast. And uh, we get dirty uh, overnight. We get dirty without even thinking about it because the world is there. And the world is always sending its messages. And that's why we need to be grounded regularly in the truth of God. A grounded Christian is a strong Christian. A taught Christian is a strong Christian able to endure difficult situations. Secondly, though, we also see them encouraging them to remain true to the faith. The second thing they did is they, after they taught them, they lifted them up and encouraged them. Now, Barnabas was a great encourager. In fact, his name means son of encouragement. And that was his nature, to encourage people and lift them up. To encourage people always, always strengthens them and lifts them up and lets them know how special they are to God. It's not encouraging to tell someone, uh, condemn them and say, uh, you need to be better. <laughs> encouragement when it comes alongside someone and says, you can be better by the power of Christ. And that was what they were doing. They wanted them to know uh, that God had saved them for a good reason and God was going to empower them and encourage them and be with them. In fact, the body of Christ is to encourage one another. The disciples stress that faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. No one becomes a Christian just by hearing someone else encourage him. We need to hear the truth of God's word, and we need to believe in God's word. And we need to be grounded in God's word first, but we also need to be encouraged by the body of believers. Every time you see a listing of spiritual gifts, you notice that preaching or evangelism or, or teaching or pastoring always uh, is one of the more important gifts. But then following those gifts are these other gifts that can be great tools of God. That is the gifts of encouragement and, and uh, mercy and helps and all these gifts, the gifts of healings and all of these things that God gives liberally to the church. Now, now, this is how we are strengthened also, is by being in the presence of people that encourage us. Our enemy is the world, but also the flesh, and the flesh is in each of our hearts. It's a reality to ministry that when you try to help someone who, is, who has been hurt, who has been wounded by the world, that person can turn on you and hurt you. There's an expression that counselors use and people in ministry use also that hurt people hurt people. <laughs> that is, the people that are wounded uh, by the sin of others also tend to wound others, even those that help them. So while we're reaching out to one another with compassion and grace and trying to help one another, we realize that sin permeates all of us. If only we could shut the door of the church and just come in all together and be safe and secure, but we can't. Because when we do that, we've also brought the world in with us, and it's right here in our hearts, that we'll be tempted uh, to do the wrong thing or react the wrong way. And when we try to help someone, it's like trying to help a wounded wild animal sometime. They can turn on us and hurt us. But this is part and parcel of being a Christian. This is part and parcel of being a servant of Christ. Uh, that we can expect to have problems and sufferings and difficulties because it lies in the nature of the case. It lies in the nature of the Christian life. This is the reality of being a follower of Christ, that we deal with a community and a body that is also fallen. If you ever played sports, you know the, the temptation to forget who the opponent really is. The way sports are, you all have one team has one uniform, you're all wearing the same uniform, the same colors, and the other team has the other uniform. The scoreboard will only say what the team does and what their team does. We know the goal of the game is to win the game. Our team should win against their team, but still, sometimes we forget who the real enemy is. And you see that within a team, there is jealousy and anger and pettiness. And competition, sometimes there's more intense competition between the members of the same team than there is against 
of the opponents. And unfortunately, that's the way it is sometimes in the church. We forget what we're doing and we get caught arguing among ourselves, disagreeing, and sometimes heart, hurtful, harmful words are said to one another. Uh, well, no matter how far uh, we go in terms of knowledge, in terms of even uh, wanting to do the right thing, uh, we see that we as believers in Christ need encouragement. We need one another. Even though the body of Christ may wound us, we need the body of Christ. We all need a spiritual friend. You need a church. You need a group. You need a friend who can encourage you. And uh, no matter who the friends were in your past, it's, it's best to have someone close at hand. Proverbs says, better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. It's better to have a Christian brother here than to have one that you remember fondly from so many years ago. So we need to share life together. We really do. Uh, the apostles in teaching the truth, they were so patient. And Paul and Barnabas in that situation, after they taught the truth, after they grounded them, they didn't say, well, good luck, boys. We're going to catch the next boat out of here. No, they stayed to encourage, to lift them up, to use proper pastoral means and methods and therapeutic methods and, and encourage them to be strong in the Lord. They were so gracious and compassionate. For example, in Romans, Paul's great treatise on, on his understanding of the teachings of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, no place else in all of his writings uh, does he speak so clearly of what the gospel is in the, as in the book of Romans. But when he comes to the end of it, he has this pastoral, encouraging tone. He says this in Romans 15, 1 and 2. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And that's the Christian faith. That's what we're to do. You and I, we all need a Christian friend. We all need a community of believers who will encourage us and strengthen us. Now, the third thing that he mentions, though, is prayer. He speaks about these leaders, and the final thing they say is they went back and appointed uh, elders in the church. Elder was the common word for uh, church leadership in the book of Acts. They appointed elders in, the, in all the churches, and then they fasted and prayed for them. They brought them before the Lord, and they committed them to the grace of God. This is about our third enemy, that is the devil himself. You and I cannot defeat the devil by our own strength. We absolutely need the strength of God. And we need to pray. We need to lift up our hands and lift up our hearts to the Lord and, and pray for leaders in the church, pray for people in the church, pray for everyone we know, pray for the lost that we may reach them. But we need to depend, to call on and depend upon the power of God. Well, it's true in a general way, I believe it always has been, that none of us prays as much or as well as we ought to. This is a common weakness in the Christian life and in the church life. So let me encourage you right now uh, to commit yourself to pray regularly for me, but also pray for the needs around you, to pray for your children, for your spouse, for your friends, uh, for needs that you have. Pray for yourself. Um, Ian Bounds is a great writer on prayer. If you've ever read any of his books, you know how great he is. But here's what he said in one of his books. He said, talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to God for men is greater still. He will never talk well and with real success to men for God who has not learned well how to talk to God for men. Evangelism is not merely talking to men about God. It's also talking to God about men. Jesus said this in John 15, 5. He said, without me, you can do nothing. And we need to regularly depend upon Christ. So when we're dealing with suffering, we're dealing with difficulty, we're dealing with problems, we're dealing uh, with afflictions and all the challenges of life, we have to understand that this is part and parcel of being a human being for one, but it is especially part and parcel of being a Christian. How do we face them? These three things. First of all, get grounded in the truth of God. Secondly, find a Christian community or a Christian friend that can encourage you and also encourage others. And thirdly, pray. 
Pray regularly for God's strength, for God's wisdom, for God's mercy and grace that he may uphold you and strengthen you. Pray for wisdom for the leaders. Right now in the world, we're facing a, a tremendous social upheaval because of what happened in the city of Minneapolis in, uh, in America. The death of George Floyd has brought uh, a, an issue of, of social injustice to people of color. It's brought this issue out and has impacted many people, many places, uh, and many societies. Even here in Europe, uh, people of color are asking, will I ever be treated with the same respect as someone who is of traditional European ancestry. Well, we as Christians need to minister the grace of God in those situations. We need to endure the suffering of facing a world that doesn't believe or a world that takes the wrong approach to a problem. We also need to encourage people and lift them up and love them. And we also need to pray uh, pray for God's strength because this problem, as every spiritual problem is, is far beyond us. But I do believe that God can lead us to victory. God can lead us to peace and joy. And He can use you and use me and use us together to make an eternal difference in the name of Christ. Well, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, let me invite you to trust in Him to turn from yourself and your sin and turn to put your faith and trust in Him. If you'd like someone to pray with you or talk to you about what it means to follow Christ, you can contact me at pastor at ibcstuttgart.de. Let me encourage you that if you're a Christian, uh, that you get grounded in the Word, uh, that you get connected to a church, and that you pray regularly for God's strength. Just talk to Him in your own heart. Let Him talk back to you through His Word and by His Spirit, and He'll strengthen you. Uh, let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your grace. Jesus Christ, we thank you for your mercy and for your salvation. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your companionship and for your, your strengthening our lives, for you filling us with your joy and your love and your grace. Lord, we lift up this broken world and pray for peace. We pray, Lord, that you may use us to be your voice in the midst of confusion you may use us to encourage the downtrodden, the ones who are discouraged, the ones who need encouragement. And Lord, that we also may be warriors that pray for you, that we expect that you will answer our prayers as we call on you. Without you, you we can do nothing. So Lord, we lift up this, this world. We lift up the, the unrest, the problems, the confusion, the pain, the the injustice. Uh, Lord, we lift up world leaders and we bring this whole world to you. And Lord, we pray that you bless us this Lord's day. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May God bless you.